uh, his teaching experience requirement and they get better get a box check. So, um, and all of you need to, I don't know, maybe you already did it or maybe you haven't yet, um, but at some point you need to do that. So that's, uh, that's required for each and every person. Okay, so with that introduction, I think I will just let to Eric to take over and uh, you know tell us what uh, what you have and uh, you know please speak loud because yeah, there's yeah. three uh, students take online maybe four even so make sure that they can hear you well and uh, Jared and if you have any problem listening to or hearing uh, what's going on here just to give uh, give us a gesture to let me know okay cool thank you Dr. Uh, my name is Aaron. Uh, I'm a second year master's student. Um, I work with Dr. Ainchi. Uh, my research is on using unmanned aerial vehicles and mesh processing machine learning techniques for application simplification. So I would like to give a brief overview of the basics of what artificial neural networks is, as well as convolution neural networks, which is called as deep learning. And we'll see a very, very basic example of uh, using a handwritten digits data set. So we are going to build a model real time now to classify the data set into numbers. Okay. Uh, first, a brief overview of what machine learning is. There has been like a lot of interest in the recent times in, in areas such as computer engineering, uh, applying machine learning. Uh, this has been something that's been explored a lot in the last decade probably. How is it different from what we've been doing with computers for a long time? Uh, so the main difference is, on a normal explicitly programming uh, method, you tell the computer what to do. So you have a lot of these statements and each statement of for loop. So you, you kind of state explicitly what you what the computer has to do. So it just follows an instruction like a slave. But what machine learning is, is where you show the computer examples of the data as well as what you want the computer to do with the data so that it has to learn a model to do that task so simply, you can tell machine learning is all about letting the machine learn from the data, and the data is something which is represented by features. Let's dive deep into this. Uh, first, a broad classification of what the types of machine learning. On a broad level, you can classify machine learning into two types, a supervised learning task and an unsupervised learning task. A supervised learning task is a, is a trivial one. When Whenever we learn about machine learning, we come, about, uh, we come across the supervised learning. So you, you have the data which represents something, and then you always have a class label in case of a supervised learning. So you give the model the data as well as the label, and then making use of the label information and the data, the model learns a representation. So the task of super, supervised learning is further classified into two types classification and regression. Uh, it's just a very fine difference. A classification is something where uh, your output class or what you want to predict from the model is a discrete ID. Whereas in case of a re regression, what you want to predict is a real value number. Uh, to give a brief example, say if you give certain features like how long did I study for a class and uh, uh, how many, uh, like several different stuff, which would actually affect my performance in a course, and then you want to predict my class grade, that would be a classification class. Because we would just be having like eight classes, maybe like A plus, A minus, A. So you have like a discrete classes, that would be a classification class. Whereas if you want to predict my final score in the class, it would be a real value number that you want to predict. It's not like a discrete number, but rather a continuous number. So it would be a regression problem. <coughs> Moving into all done. Next classification. I mean, uh, the other type of machine learning is unsupervised learning, where we don't have a label or an ID to describe the data, but you still want to do something with the data. So what you want the model to do is, you want like a flood of data, you want the model to learn some sort of a similarity or grouping that exists within the data. So in this example, as a human, it's obvious for us, but for the computer, it's just like some data points, and the possible features could be like something about the shape of whatever the fruit is, the color of the fruit, and various different things with which you can describe a fruit. So you send it into the model, and an ideal model in an utopian world 
would group all these data points into uh, groups which represent like individual fruits, like uh, a distinct fruit, so it's apple and then like whatever it is. But in this case, remember that we are not telling the model actually any sort of labels like that. Model doesn't know what each fruit is. It just based on the feature groups them according to some categories. Okay, uh, in machine learning, you, there are a lot of different models which we can make use of based on the, your data as well as your problem. So today we are specifically going to look at artificial neural networks and then the more sophisticated version, which is convolution neural networks. First, let's do, but let's see what artificial neural networks is. As the name signifies, it's like a simulated version of what a neural network is. Uh, so you try to simulate a human brain where you have like lots and lots of densely interconnected networks of neurons, which we believe are scientifically proven that helps the humans in learning all these complex patterns or help us make decisions. So by putting together such complex pattern in a mathematical form helps us solve a lot of problems which is not linear. So as you could see here, this is a structure of a neuron in the brain. So these are the dendrites, the nucleus of the cell body of the neuron, and these are the terminal part. So every other neuron gets attached to the other one. The dendrite gets attached to the terminal axon of the previous neuron. So that's how they are like connected. So the analogy in an artificial neural network is similar to a neuron, we have this structure, which is also called a neuron. What it does is it takes inputs which are represented by different features. So if you take uh, that example of uh, fruit, which we saw a while ago, it had features like shape, color. So X1 is one feature. So shape would be like X1, X2 would be a color. And if you are like describing having it with various other features, they would be like all other x3, x4, and up to how many number of features you have. So first, you do a weighted sum of all of those features. So just like any weighted mean, like there will be a weight associated for say feature one, and then feature two, and feature three. And then you take that weighted sum, and you apply a function, which we call as activation function. So that is represented by f of x, and then you have the output of the neuron. So what happens in a nutshell is in a neuron, you have certain features, you do a weighted sum, and then you apply an activation function, you get an output from the neuron. So that's just one neuron, but the brain is not just made up of one neuron, right? You have like so many of them, and that's what we are doing here as well. Just like how the neurons are connected in the brain, here there are so many neurons connected as a network to simulate our task. I'll go to the next few slides to expand the data. Okay. So the next terminal, like these are some terminology which we would be, uh, have to learn about an artificial neural network. As I told you, what happens in a neuron is a weighted sum plus a function applied on it. And the function in most cases is non-linear. So in an artificial neural network, we have something called a layer. So this first four neuron, are together a fork from the input layer, and then this is the next layer, and then you have like a final output layer. And as you could see, there is a lot of connections going on. And first thing that you need to uh, remember always is in neural network, there is no cycle. Like any neuron is not, uh, is only like for pointing forward, so there is no connection coming back. That is number one to understand. And uh, this is the simplest of networks, so it has a one hidden layer. In case of a complex network, it will have multiple hidden layer. Uh, that's number two. So, again, reiterating that fact, what happens in a neuron is, as seen here, you have inputs represented by features, and then you have some weights associated with each, in each input feature. You do a weighted sum, and then you apply an activation function, which gives us an output. So, what happens in a, in a very and an individual neuron is very simple to a linear regression problem, but the only other addition is the activation function. So if there is no activation function, an artificial neural network would just be like a, uh, like several other linear, like so much of linear regression models put together. So your output would also be a linear regression. You won't have any sort of non-linearity, so you would not be able to learn anything which is non-linear. 
Okay, looking at activation functions, uh, there have been so many activation functions explored for the task of training a neural network in literature. So, like few trivial ones are like a sigmoid function and uh, a tannage function and uh, all these like, let's not go too much into an individual functions, technical details, but the main thing to understand is an activation function which uh, is something non-linear, it's not uh, a linear function. Okay, uh, to get a more uh, physical meaning of what each layer represents, you can think of the input layer as, as something which, where you just feed in the data's features. Again, the fruit example, in this case, input number one, two, three, and four are the four features that define the data. So assume that the fruit had four features which defined it, you set it into the input layer, so those, those will be like four numbers which, which uh, represent the features. And then the output layer is one which gives you the prediction. So if it's a classification, it gives you a class label. So in that case, it was you wanted to know whether it is an apple or any other fruit. So it would give you like uh, the output as apple. Or if it is a regression problem, it will give you a real value number. It's simple. We understood what input is, what output is. So all this complexity happens in, a, in the hidden layer. And you want to know what actually happens in the layer. What happens in the hidden layer is, in every neuron in the hidden layer, a feature which is a, 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 a nonlinear combination of input dimensions, dimensions is learned. So if you look closely, every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every other neuron in the previous layer. So the first neuron in the hidden layer is connected to all the four neurons. As you can see, it's the same with every other neuron in the hidden layer. So, so you, you could kind of think of as every neuron in the hidden layer learns some feature which is derived as a combination of the input features. And this R4, R5 are going to be different. And by learning some highly nonlinear complex features, which is a function of the input feature, you are able to do the prediction that you want. Okay, so so that was a simple neural network, but we have been talking about deep learning and deep neural network a lot in the recent times. So what it is, it is the same artificial neural network, but as I said, you put more of hidden layers into the network, and then it, you call it a deep neural network. So moving on, we saw what it looks like, but the main feature of an artificial neural network or any machine learning model is it is able to learn by itself. But how does it actually learn by itself? To represent the data. For that, we need to learn what a parameter and a hyperparameter is before knowing about the training process. The parameter is in every neuron, as we saw, there is a weight associated which connects that neuron to all the all the neurons in the previous layer. And just like a linear regression problem, so if a linear regression is represented as a1x1 plus a2x2, you always have something like b, which is a bias theorem. Similarly, the weighted sum in every neuron also has a bias term, and then an activation function is applied on it. So these weights and then the bias, which is associated with each neuron in every hidden layer, is a parameter. And that's something which is not assigned by us, but actually learned or rather tweaked during the training process to achieve our, our task. Then what is a hyperparameter? A hyperparameter are other parameters which define the network, but that do not change during the training process. So as I said, you can put how many number of hidden layers you want. There's no like fixed rule. So, so that's a hyperparameter. You decide how many number of hidden layers that you're going to use before you actually start the training process. You can put how many number of neurons you want in each individual hidden layer. And that's your choice as well. So all these choices, our assumptions are, are kind of decisions that you make before you start the training process, those are called hyperparameters. And those variables which actually undergo a change to achieve the final objective, those are called the parameters. And how does the training process work? What actually happens during the training process? So first, you initialize a network like this. So in this case, you define, okay, like, 
this is going to be new, neuron number, hidden layer neuron number one, and then you kind of define uh, this is a weighted sum of all these features, and then there is like individual weights associated with every neuron. You, so you first, whenever you want to train a deep learning model or a neural network, you define your network. In that case, you define number of hidden layers, number of neurons, neurons in each layer, and everything. And then, to start training the model, you need to initialize your weights and bias in every neuron. Which means, uh, say, this is what happens in the training process is nothing but an optimization operation. In any optimization, you need something to start with. So you kind of initialize your weights and bias variables to a random variable or to zeros, however you want. There are so many methods you can use. A simple thing to, as of now, for, for understanding, let's assume that you randomly assign some values to all these weights and bias associated with every neuron. And then you start training. What happens in training? You take all your data, maybe you can send in an individual data point or, or a batch of them into the network. And this is what we call the feed forward path, the first, first step of a training. So you send in your data, and since there is already some random value assigned to all those weights, the model will do all the computations based on those initial random values, and then it will predict an output, some class value or regression value depending on your problem. So you get you get some output, some prediction, right? And then you have a label associated with every data point. So you feed that label as well to the model. Based on the label as well as the prediction from the model, it calculates the error. That's the most important step. The error is calculated as the difference between the actual prediction, uh, the actual output and the prediction. And that's when after that, after that is what the magic happens. So once the error is computed, what the neural network does is it goes on to the next step called back propagation, or you could think of as a backward pass, which uses an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. We don't want to get into all those technical details, but for our understanding, what happens is the error that is computed. We want to know how much every neuron in the network contributed to that error. So since all these are nothing but mathematical functions which are existing in each neuron, you calculate the gradient of the error with respect to that uh, neuron. Or in, a, in simple terms, you find the rate of change of the error with respect to each neuron. So you would know in an empirical you would know, like in other terms, you would know how much each neuron contributed to the error that you have in the final prediction. That's what happens here. As you can see, L is the loss or the error, and then you do like a, uh, you do you do the gradient computation or the contribution of each neuron to the error, and then you update the weights. So. You first send in a data, you found out there is some error, and then you found the contribution of each neuron to the error. And then you update the weight of each neuron as well as the bias of each neuron based on its contribution to error. So those neurons which actually contributed more to the error would be updated so that in the next pass, the prediction would be better. And those neurons which already were doing better would be like not changed much so that the prediction becomes better and better over time. So Aaron, can you stop here? Yeah. So I want the other, the other students here to look at the backward pass, the backward um, to feed the arrow backwards, right? So if you look at the DL over DX, so DLL is our loss function that we defined, right? It can be a, you know, you can have a Y minus Y hat. Y hat is your predict value. Y is your true label, and you square it. And then normally people put a one over two in the front because it's easy to calculate the derivative of that way for that to kind of move forward and, and then maybe cancel that out. But you know you can look at that, you know, the 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 chain rule of derivative is pretty important here for you to be able to do the computation because your DL over DX, that is the rate of a change of the loss function uh, with respect to the input feature of X. Right, but you are able to do that. You know the second way, the dl over dz times dz over dx. 
because that a DZ is a, so Z is is the activation, right? So it's activation. So you have the the weight, you know, like the weight the times the X, and that's one layer of activation. And there you use maybe a sigmoid function, maybe a 10H function to do the activation. So that you know when you when we choose the 10H or sigmoid or value even, you want to make sure that the it, it, its derivative actually exists and it, you can compute it. Otherwise, and that's one of the reasons that you, you know, a lot of people choose the uh, sigmoid function. And we have we derived on the board, remember, that its derivative, its derivative is a closed form. So the 10 h is so, and the ReLU is so. The ReLU is particularly simple, it's one, because it's y equals x when x is greater than zero, right? So you know that 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 chain rule is pretty important there. That allows you to do the you know the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to the input feature of the neuron, and then divide that into two steps. Okay, so that's, that's those mathematical details. You know, I think you know if you wanted to be an expert in neural network, you need to know. Uh, now let's do an example in MATLAB, as I mentioned like to classify handwritten digits. So Aaron, do you have some slides or maybe, uh, like what's the background of this data set? Oh, okay. You know, like, you know, so that they can grab the significance of it. You know, maybe you have an example or maybe you have some, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, it's the NIST uh, data set. Like, we would be able to see. Yeah, I want to make some examples. So, I'm going to load this data now and then we'll be seeing it. I'm going to display some images here. So, this is what this data that, that we have. We have images of various digits 0 to 9 uh, handwritten by so many people. So we have 10 classes, 10 distinct numbers that we want to predict. And we have about, the original data set has about 40,000, 50,000 images, but we are going to make use of only like 700 images if we have less time. We'll just use like 700 of these images to train a model, which if you view this, if you just write one by yourself and crop it into a, uh, an image which is 28 by 28, and send it into this model, we'll be able to tell you which class that belongs to. So the size of this data set is each image is 28 pixels by 28 pixels. This is grayscale, so just single channel, no, not RGB. Uh, and, and that's pretty much it. Like that's the input data. So you know, if we stop here, before we get into neural network, so we said before the, the neural network. And the traditional image processing, you know, the machine learning algorithm is you don't try to hand engineer features, right? Now we have in all those images are the you know the, the observation that we have 28 by 28 pixel matrix. I would challenge you you now if we we don't have neural network and we're trying to develop a hand engineer features to assist us with the classification of those candidates from zero. Go to nine. Look at those images. You know, can you can you think of any hand engineer feature that you can um, you can devise or develop from from these images? Say, you know, that feature really allow me to tell yes that's a zero. And that feature really really allows me to tell that's a one. Is there such thing like that? Or you know, you no know, images are there. So you know, I we wanted to pause a little bit here and uh, and I think about. It. And one more thing would be, uh, it's not the same direction. You know, there is like there is rotation of images as well. So even if we are able to engineer such feature, it should be invariant to rotation or like zooming in, zooming out, all those sort of things. I don't have, you know, I have been in image processing quite for quite quite a few years, and you know, this is a very ear posed question, obviously, right? You know, it's harder to summarize or you know kind of being able to develop some rules or descriptions or like Aaron said, if else, you know, sequences to be able to you know distinguish a one from a two or two from three. 
right? You know, any ideas are welcome. So, you know, this is a discussion. Yeah. I've heard people talking about using like lines, like take every possible line in every location, and then come up with a, a logical thought process of well, that you know, you have this line present, then you have to also have this line, and that's a seven. Okay. You know, doing all those sorts of combinations, but obviously that gets very it's difficult. A very long list of rules, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I personally. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I feel circle is probably the zero is probably also quite easy to pick up because you know, I know I know that you know there is a there's an algorithm that allows you to be able to match what that circle is on the close to the circle and then you may you know if you see two circles roughly, you know, then that's probably a zero, right? Or you know, if you got four circles that's an eight, you know, things like that. But that's, you know, it's hard. So it's, you know, a lot of the modern, like, you know, face recognition and you know, even, you know, like autonomous driving, you know, recognizing a car or a pedestrian, it turns out it's so difficult, you know, with the traditional method. So that's the, yeah, yeah. So let's see how this artificial neural network method performs on this data set. Uh, I've already loaded the data set. You can just check it in the damage model data. Oh, I'm sorry, like the distribution of this data. We have about a thousand images to represent each class. So we are using like 10,000 images in this in this process. Even though this data set is much larger than this. And this is just to read like the size of our images. I said earlier it's 28 by 28. Okay, so once we loaded our data, and after pre-processing, uh, as Dr. Gar said, if you would actually find some features which need not give you the final prediction but might help in the training process, you could always do some hand engineering, which will facilitate the model in learning easier, like faster or quicker. So rather than just feeding some raw data in most of the processes, if you could actually do some pre-processing and, and come up with some sort of features like the basic texture analysis or uh, say in case of remote sensing videos, we do like vegetation and these and stuff. So those stuff kind of helps the optimization process to converge faster. But it's not always a necessity or might not help all the time. And we don't know what those features that helps actually. So in this case, we're not doing any hand engineering, we're just directly feeding the images. And the next step after data pre-processing is splitting your data into training and testing. So you don't want to test on the same data in which you train because obviously the model has seen the data already and it will perform much better on that. So you, you want to keep your test data set like held out for the final testing process. That's what happens here. And also you don't want any sort of bias involved in this process. Say if I have my data arranged like zeros are first 10, 10, and then it, it kind of arranged in a sequence manner. And then I pick the 80% of the data for training in the case, uh, it is seeing more of one particular class and seeing less of other classes. In that case, it will perform better on one particular class and not on the other classes. We don't want that. So you can see we are doing a randomization here. So you first shuffle the whole data set before we actually split it into training and testing. And so that's also pretty important to, you know, you got the research data set. And you know it's distribution among classes, right? And then when you start to split into a training and a validation set, you want to make sure that the training is also representative of whatever the distribution of the original data set is, right? For here, you know, if you extract the 750 training images, you probably want to have 75 from zero, 75 from one, 75 from two, all the way to 75 from nine. And that's, you know, really kind of preserves the distribution of the data set. And also provide examples for all the classes to the algorithm, right? Now, if you're missing one class, a C9 is not missing from your training set then, you know, obviously it's never going to learn or not because you didn't see the data. So, so keep that in mind, okay, that's pretty important to, to preserve the distribution of your training set. And, you know, sometimes in your research, you can really make very, you know, kind of careless errors about doing that without you knowing it. For example, you know, some people like to not doing a true randomization, they kind of just 
trying to pull sequentially about the uh, about you know you're running a survey right and then what a lot of people usually do I mean you know a, an inexperienced graduate student they go into the like uh, a phone book and they start to pull you know, from the beginning you know kind of starts to pull the names but that's actually a biased sample because uh, you know the people who some ethnicity would tend to have you know like more people named after like A starts with A right and then you're really biased and in that way you're biased towards certain ethnicity which you don't want to do that way running a survey so you know you are not really intentionally to do that bias but somehow because of the way it is you're making that bias so you know just to kind of let you know about those and it, 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 it pops up a lot in the social science like you know intentionally go to a zip code that's more rich and that rich people are living that sub in a subdivision and then that can show off your prediction for the you know, credit card default importance right so that's you know that's something you need to know after you split our data set into training and testing uh, we can define our model so you want to kind of specify the hyperparameters that i said as you could see i'm defining the layers of the network in MATLAB, it's pretty simple. It's, it's just like a very simplified process. You define, you, you create something, called, an object called layers, and then you first say the first layer, which is our image input layer. So you create an image input layer of dimension 28 by 28 by 1, since it's a grayscale image in this case. And then I've decided to use three hidden layers for this, uh, or rather actually four hidden layers for this problem. But of course, the fourth layer is always the predicting layer. So, three hidden layers and how you define it. The uh, syntax is fully connected layer, and then the argument which goes into it defines the number of neurons in the layer. So, I have a first hidden layer with 400 neurons, and then a second hidden layer with 200 neurons, and then a third hidden layer with 100 neurons. And then the activation function in each of the layers, I choose this function, ReLU. So why 400, 200, 1? As, as I said earlier, this is something which you always do like a tweaking, uh, or you'll have to do an exhaustive search of a lot of possibilities. I've just like picked it out of my own choice, mainly because the input layer has an image which is 28 by 28, that will be like unwrapped into 784 dimensions. So the input layer will have 784 neurons to represent each pixel. So I picked something which is like half of it, maybe like 400 and then I I brought it down to 10. The final layer is the fully connected layer again, which is which has 10 neurons. So you, you can define it in different ways. So if you just want like a one final prediction, I would add one more layer after this layer with 10 neurons. But what actually happens in this layer with 10 neurons is it has a softmax function. So you can think each of these 10 neurons represent each class. And then since you have a softmax uh, uh, defined on that layer, each neuron will give, give, give you like uh, the probabilistic estimate of this image belonging to that particular class. But if you actually want like a final output, which is just the class, then you can add like a layer uh, which, which finds the maximum probability and then you have like a final class ID. A few more things about softmax. So um, we haven't introduced softmax yet. Yeah. So it's so how many of you have taken Dr. Miles uh, fuzzy logic class already? So it's, it's more of like a fuzzy boundary, right? So when you say something belongs to a male or female cat or dog, you are not saying 100% sure this is a dog. You you assign a probability, and your decision would be based upon you know what whatever is the highest probability you are given to that class, and your prediction would be that class. Knowing that, you know, if you are saying that with 90% probability, you are more sure than you're saying that with 75% or 50% probability. So that's the idea of soft math, right? But at the end, after soft math, you do have a, you know, you do say this is zero or one or two or three. And, uh, but, you know, giving, you know, the, the nice thing about a soft max is that it does give you some sort of a probability associated with that. So that you know you 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 do have the evaluation of how sure you are about that claim. Okay. 
And also, one thing that I want to point out is that Arrow didn't really do the convolution of part of it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So this, been, is a, doing... this is a this is a a conventional uh, multiple multi layer uh, neural network. So how many layers? you have here three hidden so I got it okay so if you scroll up so you got so that first fully connected layer now it's highlighted so that's after the input so that's your first hidden layer that it got 400 units in it and then that is uh, with a ReLU activation see the ReLU there and then after what that 400 you got a 200 that which is kind of cut by half so that's your second layer and that is also a ReLU activation and then the third one is 100 and that's you know that's another fully fully connected layer, and that's with the activate activation function of Redu again, and then your you know the fourth one that's fully connected layer, but with the soft mass and the classification, and that's your output. That's where you get a zero, one, two, three, four the label. Okay, nothing is in convolution yet. Now, last time I want you. Are you gonna run a yeah. convolution yeah. example yeah. to yeah. compare the accuracy? the same MNIST, everything same. Yes, I request fully like to uh, So you, you you can you can compare, right? Yeah, we can results. compare the accuracy. So I would argue, you know, even before he runs the analysis, I would argue that the convolution would be better because now what he does is you know take the image as input, but the neural network because there is no convolution, neural network would have just reshaped to a one D array, which got you know twenty eight by twenty eight input features. Each of those become each of those pixels become one feature. Now you can sort of see that by doing so, you may lose some of the spatial association or spatial arrangement of it. You know what I'm saying? You know, if I take a picture and I, you know I recognize your face, and the reason that you are able to recognize the face is because all the there's a spatial redundancy of the pixels around the face, right? Now I can perfectly go in. And I keep all the pixel information, the intensity value exactly the same, but I randomize it. And then you lose that face, right? Because it becomes everything can be randomized. So, so this is sort of like that. There's an analogy between that and that is because you know you, you don't really use, you know, there is some utility there that you are actually, you know, by selecting the weight in a way that you know you can tune up some weights and tune down some weights for those connections that somehow can also utilize that spatial arrangement, but it's not as effective as a convolution. Convolution is a better way to be able to use the spatial information, the spatial redundancy. Yeah, and also another thing that would be, uh, you call this optimax layer as a, as a squishing function. So since you have a ReLU layer in every hidden layer, a ReLU is an identity function, as uh, Dr. Gio said, in, on the positive x it is an identity function. So based on your feature, input feature, uh, you might have numbers which grow in size with as, as it goes to the layer. But your class ID is only like zero to nine. So you use this max layer so that uh, all these weighted sums and then their function uh, uh, get restricted to zero to one, so that it, it represents a probability. If not a softmax layer, if you use anything, if you use any other function which is not in the scale of zero to one, you won't be able to. Uh, Restrict the output to the to, to zero to one. Okay, so now that we have defined our uh, network architecture, we are defining this other so-called hyperparameters, which uh, which define the training process. I would say so. The, in addition to the stochastic gradient descent method for training, there are several other algorithms. So I'm, in this case, I'm using the basic one, SGDM represent represents that and the initial learning rate it has how fast the model learns from the data so that's another hyperparameter as well and maximum epoch and epoch is something which defines how many times that you make use of the input data to train the model so there are like 750 images assuming that each data point is sent individually after 750 iterations I'm out of data, but the training is not going to stop. So you start again sending the first, uh, sending it from the first data point, and you call it the next epoch. So one epoch takes over when the model has seen every data point once. So when the model starts seeing the data point again, that's the next epoch. So in this case, I'm like making the model see every data point four times. So we have four epochs. 
and there are like other arguments to uh, define. Let's not care about it. So, Aaron, you may want to explain, like, you know, I don't see a, you know, a mini batch here. You know, yeah, that's it, something you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. So, um, maybe, I guess it's set to default. I think if this 30 is, I mean, yeah, this 30 is a mini batch. So, what mini batches, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, of course, it will be great if you keep sending each data point individually, but it increases the computation time because every data point will go through the whole network and then you do the error computation like every for every point, right? If you have like 50,000 images, you don't want to do it like 50,000 times. And also, the if you calculate the error for every data point, the optimization process, there'll be a lot of oscillations because the local variations are too much. So what you do is you, you do something called mini batching. Out of like, I have 750 images here, rather than sending each image individually, I, I make sending 30 images as a batch. So what happens in the forward pass? The 30 images, one after other are sent into the network. The error calculations are made, but the back propagation does not happen. The back propagation starts only after accumulating the error of all the 30 data points. So in this case, the gradient that is calculated is like an average of 30 points rather than just one point. So there is no like too much of fluctuation in the training process, and also you reduce the computational time. Is that making sense? So you you got a three seven uh, seven. 50 training sets. So you, you, you get 30 first, it gets through it, and then coming back and then it be the next 30, and then you do 25 times for the training, and that's called an epoch. That epoch is when you see all those. And what he has here for the, you know, for one of the hyperparameters, the maximum epoch is, is to go through four times. So to go back and forth, it's, it's actually more than four times, right? It's uh, four times to uh, 25. Almost one. I'm not times. sure if 30 is the actual batch size. Oh, yeah, I don't know. But so just let's do like it's something like a normal you've got a mini batch, right? Yeah. Mini batch. Yeah. So that's what mini batch is. You you never do individual data points and you have to do mini batch. I have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, I was wondering, so does that mean that the number of epochs and the the mini but all it does is just reduce the computation time and it, it, it does not affect the training process at all no it does affect the training process more than computation time time how it affects the training process is the important thing and that's why we are using it so how it affects is if you send individual data point and uh, if if loss is computed or error is computed every time uh, you can see of uh, you can imagine this whole process as there is this there is this curve or a function and then you are find, trying to find the minimum of that function. So, uh, I'm just drawing the board. I'm just doing a 2D. So, assume that your error function is something like this, but but actually here it's, it'll be in a high dimension space. So, in the training process, you start from somewhere like here, and then you want to go to this place where the error is the, the, the minimum. But this is the so called global minimum, like the, the absolute minimum of this whole function. But this function might be something like this. So during the training process, you might you might fit into this part, which is a local minimum. So after this process, this process, the this, this slope is zero. So if you actually get caught up in that space, you won't be able to get out of there, and the model will be like stuck in that forever. You won't be able to train anymore. So if you are finding the error for every data point, there is a very high chance that because of very small changes, you might get caught up in this. But if you do like a mini batch, the error is averaged over like 30 or whatever number of data points. So the so from every update, the, the fluctuations will be, so, so when you update the weights, the changes will be more. So the chances of you getting caught up in like a local minima is very less. I don't know if, if, if I was explaining it properly. So, you know, I think, you know, Aaron, you, you explain that fine. You know, I think you, you want the answer is yes, it does. If, that's the computation. You know, actually, the way that you set up your mini batch or the you know, number of epochs and uh, you know, all those parameters would affect your actual results. So yeah. it was uh, so that's the reason why so when you use artificial neural network for deep learning, the tuning is so important. So you know you wanted to try a lot of different combinations of those hyperparameters in the hope that you will find a combination that 
gives you the best uh, results. Now, a lot of the examples that we see in the class is, you know, we designed those or we set up those parameters. So because, you know, a lot of those initial finding of that sweet spot already done by other researchers. So, but if you have a fresh new problem at your hand, I guess you are probably going to spend three months or, you know, six months just to try to find out what is my best combination of all those hyperparameters for my particular problem. And there is not a, like a, you know, uh, good for all solution uh, or the, or, you know, directions for, for, for those parameters. That's why we call deep learning or machine learning as, as not just science, but art as well. But it is okay. A lot, you know, a lot of it's still better than hand engineering hand because, because, because you know, you know, it's hard. So now uh, we have defined our network. We defined our hardware parameters. We are ready to train the model. I'm gonna run the code to train it. As you can see, so that's done. We are training for just four epochs. I was wrong, so mini batch is not 30 because here you could see iterations per epoch. What iteration is uh, the number of times that the weights were updated, and obviously uh, it depends on your batch size. So the, you, if our input was actually 750 images, and if there are like 58 updates made per repo, which means that our batch size was 750 by 58, whatever. So we reach an accuracy of about 95 percentage in the validation data. It's a validation accuracy, not the final training accuracy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's move on to convolution neural networks, and we can come back to it to train the convolution network. Right. So can you go back? Can you go back to the you know that the training okay. graph? Yeah. So you know I wanted you to look at it, you know, the validation accuracy there. It's ninety four point five percent. But normally, so um, depending on the particular problem you're working on, if you're working on cancer data, you, know, you only got two classes. Uh, you know you either got a true or false, right? So in those cases, you know you you wanted to compare this this number with fifty percent. Because that's your random guess, right? So even though you have no information, you just randomly point out two or four. You still got fifty percent of the time you will be right. Um, you know, this what this particular case is a little bit more challenging because you have ten cases. The complete random guess would be only ten percent of the, uh, the accuracy. So you know this is actually a pretty nice performance. If you have an overall uh, performance of uh, ninety four point five. Right, so just to keep that in mind, and you know, don't just read. It. Sometimes, particularly if you look at, you know, you see an accuracy of seventy-five, how are you going to interpret that? becomes pretty important depending on what's your problem. Okay, so seventy-five is a pretty decent here, but seventy-five, seventy-five is maybe not so much impressive for uh, you know to call out a cancer or you know, good or bad. Right? Yeah. So accuracy is just just one of the performance metrics. So based on your problem. In case of medical problems where but there is more importance to one class or there is more importance to uh, doing a wrong positive false positive prediction than of uh, false negative prediction like all those cases you need to consider and you'll have to you know look for those metric according to yes i was so it's it's really interesting i'm happy that you bring that up you know the, the here are medical experts yeah which one is more severe or significant a patient to come is the false positive or you know a false negative more significant? You know, is the can they get more? Which would you be more scared, more like right? concerned about a false positive or a false negative? False yeah. negative. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but that's not something that I wouldn't be concerned about. Like maybe I would take false positive and false positive and false negative in the same way in an agricultural problem or like in some other case. So. Accuracy is not just the one performance metric based on which you you kind of benchmark your model based on your application area. How how bad like how much of false positive and how much of false negative you need to look into that as well. So you need to look into the confusion metrics and right. Well, yeah. the other thing is you, know, you have a mammogram you look at 
and the, you know, historically, we look at all the mammograms we've taken before, and you know, you know, that 90% that's not a breast cancer. Right? And then, you know, if you just use accuracy, and the doctor would have an extremely high accuracy, he says every time he just say negative, negative, right? And then, so then, so in those cases, accuracy isn't really a nice metric for the overall model evaluation. Then you have to look for other metrics, right? Because, you know, it's simply easier because one class got more in the population. And then, you know, your program can just predict that the class in order to get a higher accuracy, overall accuracy. But you know that's not the scientific way to do research. And you should not get that in the paper, right? Another thing that as we discussed earlier, if the distribution of the test data is not perfectly distributed as well, then we'll have a skewed, like you might see like there's a very high accuracy, but the model might just be like, be good enough to predict some numbers better than other numbers. So your validation accuracy will not be a true measure of the actual performance. So let's get into convolution neural networks. Uh, it's very similar to the artificial neural network. The only thing is the fully connected layer, where each neuron is connected to every other neuron in the previous layer. That assumption is changed here. Uh, that that particular fact is changed here. So instead of a neuron which is connected to every neuron in the previous layer, you replace it with convolutional filters or convolutional uh, windows. So there are just three basic components of a convolutional neural network architecture. One is the basic convolution layer, since it's been dealt in the task. Convolution is familiar to you. And we have something called a pooling layer, which is mainly used to uh, reduce the dimension. So if I send in an image, which is uh, uh, 50 by 50, and if I get a class label, which is just a single valued number, if I apply, apply a convolution uh, with padding, like, I mean, uh, have you heard of padding and stuff? Yes, we'll, we'll yeah. cover, we'll cover the padding. So yeah, if, if, we, if we do convolution with padding, the input dimension will Retain so even after how many filters you apply, the, the image size is going to remain the same. But you want the output to be a single number. So how do you map it? That's why you kind of add this so-called pooling layer, which reduces the input dimension, and then you do it like in a step-by-step -step manner, so that ultimately you have like an individual single number. So a convolution is yeah, it's been dealt in the class, so you would be familiar with this. A pooling layer is something like this. So you have you have an image which is four by four, or any layer which is four by four. What's pooling layer is if I define, uh, there are several options. So if I'm defining something called a match pooling with a two by two filter, what it does is a two by two filter goes over the space, finds a maximum number, which is six. Here it's eight, three, and four. So the output of this four by four, uh, yeah. So the output would be like six, eight, three, and four. In this case, your input dimension of four by four, like 16 pixels is reduced to just four pixels. And then you stack all these layers together, like we'll be seeing this now. Okay, yeah, so Alan, can you go back so to the pooling layer? So there are there's a couple of ways to do pooling. Um, you know, you can do an average of pooling, meaning basically you look at all those cells and you do an average and then pull that out. And then you can do max, Maximum pooling, right? So maximum pooling is you look at the maximum number and we get that out. Um, there's a reason for it. the maximum pooling is certainly become the mainstream pooling method, right? And there's a reason for it is remember when we look at our, you know, the filtering example, if you have a match of the detector with the portion of the image you're looking at, you get a maximum value. And that's the reason why. So a max means that there's some sort of matching of your filter that you know the, the, the algorithm learned. Or, you know, or in case of the image segmentation, you actually predefine a filter. That you've got all those you know, coefficients predetermined already. And there's a match to it. And then, you know, remember the horizontal edges and the vertical edges get detected. And all those are large values that you know, will be pulled out by the maximum pooling and used as a feature of being fed to the next layer, if that makes sense. Right? So the whole idea of a convolutional neural network is original image get convoluted, you know, kind of being able to abstract simple features. Simple feature means curves, lines, uh, you know, edges, those, those kind of stuff. And then those features is the next layer of convolution in the hope that you can get more advanced features, right? such as, you know, your contour of your face or your contour of your mouse or, you know, the, the shape of, you know, your 
and all those things. And then the hope, for, the hope is that you know, when you get those morphisms the deeper into the neural network, you are able to abstract a lot of those kind of you know more advanced features that is very challenging for you know our conventional image processing to to be able to extract, right? And then use those for your decision uh, process. Yeah. So two main differences. One being uh, you preserve the spatial association present in the image. So in case of a neural network, like every pixel becomes an independent feature. Whereas in this case, since you apply convolution, you still preserve the spatial uh, association in the image. Number one. The other thing is, as you can see here, every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every other neuron in the previous layer. So for each of those connections, you'll have a vacant, but you'll have a weight, right? So the number of parameters that you have for a similar fully connected network is much higher compared to a convolution network because however the size of whatever the size of the image, a convolution has only the number of uh, dimensions. Which is defined by the size of the filter. So if you have a three by three filter, you only have nine, uh, uh, nine like uh, parameters to learn. And if you have like 10, 10 convolution stack together, nine times ten, you only have ninety parameters, irrespective of the size of the input image. Whereas in this case, the size of the input image or the number of neurons in the previous layer directly affects the number of parameters in the next layer, and it just blows up after a certain point. So reduction in the number number of parameters to train is another important thing. Oh. So this is how you stack all those convolution and polling layers. So in this case, our problem is you want to you want to recognize whether this image is a car or a truck or a van. So it has like several classes as you can see at the end. So you're sending in this image and then it seems a very small filter, maybe like depending on the size of the image, it could be a three by three or five by five filter. So you have like a convolution, some convolution. Uh, maybe three here. I don't know. We don't know the network architecture, but you have like a stack of convolutions which is applied on, on this input image. So in the next layer, you have like a whole block with so many features learned from the convolution, and then radio activation function was applied on it. After that, as I mentioned, you want to downscale the image. You apply a pooling layer, so as you could see, the dimensions gets reduced proportionally. Again, you put a convolution layer. And then pulling layer. So this is what happens in every convolution neural network. You just you just add more and more layers of convolution followed by pooling in a typical task, uh, depending on how many data set, how, how many training examples you have. And finally, what you do is at a certain point your image gets reduced into something like very small like this. Maybe this is just a 10 by 10 uh, features here. But you would have learned like a lot of features in this case. From that, you want to predict the output. This is very important. This step where you call it a flattening, or you convert the convolution layer into a fully connected layer. Uh, so assume that this was a three by three image, and you had like 50 filters here. So 50 and three by three, you have like uh, uh, nine by 50, 450 pixels in here. So in the flattening layer, all these 450 pixels get converted to a single, a single one-dimensional array. And then it's the same process as the previous artificial neural network. A full, a like maybe another fully connected layer, and then a final layer which is proportional to the number of classes. Softmax gives you the probability. This, this, this is the tip, so keep in mind, this is a typical kind of architecture for mm -hmm. convolutional neural network. And when you read the paper, you will likely see this. So, and now you are familiar with that. And so it's fairly fairly common that you it's almost the you know the dominant case that you start with the image which is a pretty large in the spatial domain but you only got a three layers rgb right so three layers and then as you go deeper into the neural network the spatial domain starts to shrink because you do the convolution in particular if you do the uh not not to pan not choose not to pan it right if you do the valid convolution and then the, you know it's gonna size, it will shrink, and also because that as you do the pooling, right? So pooling is a, you know, kind of almost a sub sample, it's a uh, down sampling process too, right? So it's, it's gonna shrink, but the 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 third dimension of that block is gonna increase because that is determined by how many filters you choose to use to to go through that particular layer, right? And then typically 
it doubles every time that you go through. So the first time you maybe choose 20, and the second layer, you're gonna choose 40. And then the third layer, you're gonna choose 80. So that's very typical um, you know, way of doing it. And then so you, at the end, you see that, that the block, you've got a fairly small space, you know, fairly small in spatial size, maybe just you know, kind of you know, 20 pixels or 30 pixels, but you've got, it's very thick. You've got a, a long list of features that you have to expect. And then you flat it into a you know, fully connected. Okay. So uh, it's typical. It's very you no. Know, it's it's there in the deep learning literature. If you read the paper, you see it. Uh, so up until now, we've only been seeing applications where we do classification. But there has been so much of advances in deep learning that there are so many other applications as well, which is more sophisticated. We'll just look like how we look at them. This application is what you would call a semantic segmentation. So the final output is just not a single number, but you feed in this image and then you want the model to do like this segmentation or like discretization process. So in my in, in, in for my masters, I'm I'm trying to do like a weed weed uh, identification from UAV imagery. So in my case, I have three classes: soil, crop, and weed. So I'll have like a map with three distinct classes colored like this. And then the next one is the classification that we have been doing, but the additional part of localization. So the model in addition to just giving you a class which represents cat, you also get uh, parameters that define a rectangle. So in this, like the minimum parameters that is needed to define a rectangle. So you get a point, uh, like a value to, that defines this point, and then you get the width and breadth of the rectangle. So in this case, the model has to do two things. One, it has to output the class, and also it has to output the, uh, the parameters of this bounding box. But the main assumption in this case is there is only one class present in each image. Then you move on to another complexity. You have more classes, and then you have more instance of each class. And then you want to find each individual one of them. So it will give you three different classes, dog, dog, cat, and then the model also gives you Three bounding boxes, three rectangles to, you know, give the boundary of each object. And then the final is called an instance segmentation, where you don't do a segmentation of the whole image, but it just finds the class uh, on which it has been trained for. So here it doesn't care about the back, and it just gives you dog dog cat, but then it also draws a contour around it. So these are just like sophisticated methods built on top of the same uh, similar. Uh, Network. So, okay, I'll just go through quickly, but maybe you can read ahead. In, the, in terms of classification, after this part, you flatten it to get a fully connected layer, right? So the intuition is, in, in, in any case where you don't want a single number, but want those kind of outputs with an image, you again upsample it from this process. So it's like a reverse process. You again have a convolution, but it's a transpose convolution. So you do this, so it again blows up in the spatial domain, and ultimately you get the same resolution of the input image. So if you stop here, so keep in mind the three, the three levels for complexity you have in image processing. First one is the classification to be able to tell if it's a cat or it's a dog, right? Then the second one is localization, you not only tell where if there is an object, being able to point out where it is, like being able to draw up around it. And the third one is really detection that you have different objects. And you know, maybe there's a, multiple objects from one class. I mean, you will not only be able to tell what object it is, but also draw bounding marks. I mean, that's the object detection, and that's the very core of it. With respect to this class, relevant applications are in agriculture, uh, any sort of detection from imagery, remote sensing imagery, UAV imagery, ground-based imagery, everything, detection, press detection, 
all sort of stress detection, uh, any sort of sensing and information needed from soil samples or uh, plant like new leaf nitrogen content, etc. And there's been a lot of work in biomedical image analysis. <clears throat> any images, uh, any biomedical images from which you, you want to train a model to di for diagnosis purposes. That's th that's something like a lot of people are working on recent times, so it might be of interest to you. And another thing is, it's not just about biomedical images. You don't need ima images all the time. Even if you have any sort of signals, you can transform it from the frequency domain onto an image, and then you can try to apply uh, deep learning. Uh, an interesting application is, uh, like of course, EHP analysis, there is a paper from a master's student in computer science from UNL, uh, a thesis actually on using EEG and uh, deep learning. Uh, and also, uh, like as part of the class, I was I, I had to work on an example where we were given data set of, uh, of audio files where people were speaking in different languages. So we were just trying to identify the emotion. So it's more like emotion identification where the signal was converted from the frequency domain onto an image and then a convolution neural network was applied. So yeah, all you need is just a signal which can be converted into a 2D object. Let's do the same data set. Um, most of the hyperparameters the same. Just replace the fully connected layer with the convolution layer. So I'm going to run everything to get, or maybe we we'll look at the architecture of this profile. So as I mentioned, I just replaced the fully connected layer uh, with a convolution 2D layer. Uh, okay, in simple terms, this is something like, we call it batch normalization. Uh, you can just think of this as a step which is done to prevent uh, the gradients from exploding to a very large number. This was a seemingly simple, like this was a very simple task. Still we have a 5% difference. As the task gets complex and the imagery, say if it was 28 by 28, if you have a 500 by 500 image, and then you have it as an RGB image, there is going to be a very significant difference. Like maybe you won't even get a, any sort of decent performance with using a simple neural network. You would need a convolution neural network. That's it. Right, this was like yeah, any questions? Yeah, so a lot of those, you know, when Aaron mentioned about, you know, those, you know, being able to look at the natural language processing, right? So the translation, real time translation, you know, being able to tell the, you know, the emotion of the person, uh, you know, either by taking the image and see, be able to see if he's happy or, you know, the grumpy face, or, you know, kind of looking at the, being able to look at the, the voice of the, you know, analyze the language. And that's, those are very core to the social media companies. The, 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 the whole industry is based upon that. Yes, you know, being able to kind of do an in, augmented reality in the draw. I don't know, you know, like a birthday cake or something you know, around, you know, the, the town, around the town. Yeah, yeah, smiley, being able to show the, you know, where the face is and put in the crown. Right. Those really are you know, very, very core of a lot of the industries. So you, you need to be able to see that. You know, that's, you know, if opportunity come to you during your career, don't miss it. That's uh, that's the thing, and then being able to talk to those people in an intelligent way is mm -hmm. you know you know that's you know what they, how they make money off of it, right? You know, that, and also you know a lot of us a credit card company, you know, and also rely on machine learning more and more these days. Being able to tell if customers gonna be default or not, right? And if he's gonna be you know is it safe to loan? Kind of, issue an alarm to this person, depending on the demographic data, or, you know, other data information that they get, right? And also advertisement, another one, you know. I bought I bought something from Amazon, like the next day, the same product show up on my <laughs> website, like doing uh, advertisement on me. And so that's exactly how they know, those are, those are the backbone technology. 
the kind of ecosystem uh, that, that's kind of you know, dependent on that. I mean, that's fine. So, you know, go over this example. I think what I'm going to do on Thursday before gets so I'll give you another example. And then maybe it's more for real time that you know, we can train a model. And then we can hook up with it to a, mm -hmm. uh, to a you know, camera and then you know, take, a, take your own face or something other, you know, or we can raise up an object that is to <coughs> be able to tell. Okay, and then, then we'll, we'll finish this module. And hopefully what we'll, we'll gets to the presentation to look at you know the application of different areas. And then we need to think about the cost project. And they, I, I already mentioned that we get a uh, you know, biomedical data set, which is MI uh, image data set that uh, Dr. Forrest with a student uh, volunteer to offer, which is really nice. But you know, we got other students here, and uh, I have some thoughts and I will I was trying to email you guys starting from today and it's sort of showing all the ideas. Hey, you know, here's the idea. I think that you know, we got the data. I think we're going to work. It may take some labeling from you guys. Would you like to work on this problem? So we, you know, going kind to of pay attention to those emails and we can, uh, hopefully, I, you know, hopefully I can find at least you know, kind of three or four interesting topics, including the biomedical ones where you guys work on. Yes, thank you. No, it's going to be, I, I'm hoping that it's three or four projects. Okay. I think that's, you know, three, four, given a, given the number of students, so maybe, you know, you don't have to, you know, particularly for the biomedical people, you don't have to stay with biomed, but, you know, more, 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 more likely than not that you are going to. Uh, and then there's a, you know, three persons that not plan. They are closely, you know, their physical proximity makes sense that you, they, they are actually working on the same um, project. And then maybe the rest of the students here that work on another one, you know, three projects. Okay, and then we have a lot of people who are officially not, I guess, we're missing a few because of the weather probably. It's the end of the Chinese New Year. And today is the, is the Chinese New Year. So, uh, yesterday, I guess. So, but, um, but if they can join, and then you will be joined by more force who will be in Okay? Is that all? Is that kind of clear? Okay. All right. I hope you feel like you learned something. It's, um, you know, that's, use, that's the useful stuff because this is where the, it looks like this is where the science is going. This is also reflect our natural tendency to be lazy. You know, we don't <laughs> want to do, right? It, it is. You know, you know, Psychologically, it is exactly that reason. You know, we don't want to hand the engineer teach our, our discovery of all anymore. That's the kind of just the kind of develop. You know, it, this is good for all stuff, right? You know, you, you know, you just kind of develop an architecture. You know, throw a bunch of data into it, figure that out. So, yeah, we are all lazy, basically. <laughs> all right. So the guys that uh, you all you all doing fine. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Great. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll get uh, we'll get together again on Thursday. Then see you all. Thank you.